<laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, so, okay, we're going to talk a lot of, about early childhood education, which is this interesting sector. We'll spend a lot of time, especially these great founders we have here today. So, I'll start asking you, like, briefly tell us about what, what you're building. What's your angle to early childhood? So, Sarah, you want to go ahead? Hi, I'm Sarah Moskoff. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Winnie. We are a childcare marketplace. I got into early education and childcare because about seven years ago now I had a child um, and I was working and I got went back to work soon after having my daughter and uh, realized it was really freaking hard <laughs> to be a working parent. And I started chatting with my coworker who, spoiler alert, is now my co-founder. Uh, and she was like, yeah, Sarah, it is pretty hard. She had actually dropped out of the workforce for a period of time to have her kids and had re-entered. Um, and we kind of realized when we put our heads together that the great engineers we had been used to working with throughout our careers at like Google and Twitter and all these places were not working on solving problems for families. Uh, and so we, we started Winnie really to make childcare and early education more accessible, affordable, higher quality uh, for families. And, and that's what we've been up to ever since for the last six and a half years. Cool. I'm Rod Morris. I'm co-founder and president of Love Every. And Love Every is an early learning system for children and their parents. Our flagship subscription program is in 30 markets worldwide. We've been in market for a little over four years. And um, I guess a stat I would, I would throw out to give you context around what we're all about is, uh, you know, in the U.S., in, in that market, there's uh, a little over 41,000 zip codes. And uh, if you look at the Montessori census and look at Montessori preschools, Montessori schools, they're in about 3,000 of those zip codes. Um, and since we've been in market, uh, we've been able to put Montessori program, uh, Montessori inspired program in the hands of people in 22,000 zip codes. So in, in very short order, by taking a different approach with our program, we're just able to put curriculum and science-based learning and, and ed education in the hands of parents uh, in, in many more places and just democratize access. And that's something we're very proud of. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Bennett. I'm the CEO of Wonder School. Started the company five years ago. Uh, my personal story is I, uh, I went to a home-based childcare program as a kid in uh, Miami and had an incredible experience in it. And fast forward to you know, 20, 30 years later, I moved to the Bay Area and I keep hearing from my friends that they're having a hard time finding childcare. And I didn't understand why they weren't putting their kids in these home-based programs because they're so awesome. And so I actually spent a good amount of time in them and realized that the, the folks who were running the programs really needed a lot of support with marketing, with business operations. So I actually like became the CMO of a childcare program for about three months, helped them turn around their business, and then started my own childcare program out of a home in the Bay Area to uh, learn everything about uh, running and operating a childcare program, and then built a, a marketplace to help people start and operate childcare programs out of their homes. And uh, I don't know if I shared this, but yeah, I'm the CEO of Wonder School. Excited to be here with you all. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Eric Berger. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Common Sense Networks. Our consumer-facing brand is Sensical. We're a for-profit affiliate of the nonprofit Common Sense Media. And we started this business around the idea that the internet has become extremely toxic for kids. It is for adults too, you could argue, but we're focused on kids. And what's happened as the migration to digital from television and other media has really gone to open user-generated platforms that are built for adults. So 80% of kids spend hours per day on these open platforms, more so than subscription services and closed environments and more so than television. And these are not built for kids. They're toxic, as I mentioned. There's privacy issues, self-esteem issues, um, hate speech issues, et cetera. And so what we're doing is we're sourcing um, we're certifying, uh, we're packaging, distributing, and monetizing healthy creators in an environment that is age appropriate for kids, two through 12. We've got three age segments, uh, preschool, two to four, then five to seven, and eight and up. And all of this is based on a content vetting process um, taken from Common Sense Media. They've been evaluating content for 20 years using uh, age appropriate child development standards. We've applied those standards to uh, content here. We rate it and we package it all along lines of interest. 
so that kids can explore their areas of passion in a way that's not fueled by an algorithm. Um, it's fueled by the humans that put this together in an age-appropriate way. Awesome. Now, these are all great stories. So let, let's start. E even though, and from all the things you've told us, it seems like early childhood is like an obvious market. And but I mean, and this, despite of that, the dollars invested in the in the industry have been like a tiny fraction of what we've seen in other like in other b b industries that have been raising money from from venture capital funds. So what I like to know is like, why do you think the industry is like or seems at least underfunded? And, and it's a, it's a com combined question. So what do you think have been the challenges of existing providers in, in childcare education and also like new, new entrants in the, in the market? So who wants to start? Probably Rod, Rod you can start as okay. you were telling about sure. how you were expanding access. Uh, so I think uh, access to capital for early education, it's interesting. So when my co-founder and Jessica and I, whenever we've, we've gone on, on fundraising you know, trips and, and spent time talking to investors, we know that if we're talking to an investor who's recently gone through parenthood with you know, kind of a baby or a toddler, um, we know that the odds of them being interested in wanting a second meeting and wanting to dig in are, are 10x uh, versus if it's like you know, a standard sort of like maybe white guy whose kids are in college or something like that. They, um, they're, they're much slower to get it. Typically, uh, I think what's changing, uh, what we're seeing is, I, I think like, you know, the data speaks for itself. There's a lot more investment in, in early education uh, over the last few years. You're seeing funds grow. Uh, we were fortunate to have Reach as an early investor in, in Love Every, um, and we've had other investors who kind of got it early, like Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. But, um, you know, I think there's still tons of work to do where you just see more diversity reflected in the investor base. And also, you know, investors who are, are closer to this, you know, pivotal and, and also just hugely just sort of like painful, overwhelming, you know, customer experience and being a parent um, going through early childhood. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a massive like $400 billion parenthood market out there. And I think these investors are starting to get wise about going after it. So it's getting easier, I would say. Yeah, my hot take, uh, I agree with all those points, but I would also add that especially in childcare and early education, the area I, you know, Winnie focuses on, the labor is predominantly performed by women, especially women of color, uh, who we know their labor is incredibly undervalued. Um, so, you know, this work has been like invisible. We haven't, we haven't assigned a value to it. Um, and so there just hasn't been the money pouring into this industry. And I think that's, that's a huge problem. Um, and then, you know, you couple that with the fact that the people investing um, are, you know, typically more affluent and well off. Um, you know, they don't recognize that the importance of, of group licensed care, which actually serves the majority of families in the United States, it's not a nanny or a babysitter, which is, you know, a question we get on Winnie all the time, like, you know why aren't you building for, you know, finding my night nanny? Like, because that's a, a tiny fraction of the market and we're focused on the 99% right now. So I think, you know, investors have to open their eyes to how uh, the real uh, population <laughs> operates and also uh, we need to value women's labor. Any other comment? Hmm? You know, I, I would just say, and, and we're slightly adjacent, um, uh, to the childhood education that, that you're talking about. But when we started, which was later than some others had started, and we talked to some investors about how to approach a model that made sense for them, one of the things that we heard a lot was the churn issue um, and not getting the return on the customer acquisition cost because it's a very small cohort on a relative basis. And so in designing that, we really tried to think about how do we expand the ages? How do we get more scale? Uh, which is part of the service goes from two to 12 so that the whole family can be involved for over a decade and multiple um, child generations, if you will. And then also the global versus domestic nature. So, so a lot of these businesses tend to be very domestically focused and harder to translate to a global um, uh, audience. And so again, the type of approach that we're taking, the content that we're taking is all very global in nature, you know, to provide for the scale issues. That, that's a great point you make. And I, I wanna like, take from that, like. Universal childcare is like a thing <laughs> in our countries. So, what do you think is the role that the government can can, can play? In, I mean, not only in providing like funding, etc., but also like pushing innovation in this sector in the U.S. 
So, uh, yeah, at Wonder School, we partner with a lot of state governments, and um, we've been spending a good amount of time uh, with the federal government just understanding where, where the federal government's going with um, universal child care. And there seems, there, just, there seems to be a lot of uh, public pressure, uh, p positive pressure, mm -hmm. to uh, you know, roll out universal child care. And, and, and uh, the leaders, the folks who are like, taking the lead on it are, tend to be cities, cities with a, um, a pretty strong tax base or counties with a strong tax base. But when, when we think about it at Wonder School, we think that there's a, it's like inevitable um, in the United States we'll eventually get to universal child care. And, uh, we're big supporters of that. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to be sort of living under a rock to not see in the news that like one of the biggest issues facing the childcare industry right now is the staffing crisis. Like, we need to attract top talent to the field and retain that talent. And one of the reasons we can't is we don't pay early educators well enough. Um, and you know okay, that seems like an obvious solution, we should pay them more, but then when you look at families, they're already struggling to afford childcare. Over half of the families in the United States receive no group early education prior to, their, their kids receive no early education prior to kindergarten. Um, and so there has to be money from somewhere else. If families are already stretched and we need to pay better, where is the money coming from? And that's where I think the government and universal pre-K really comes into play. And there's already, you know, this is not unprecedented. The government already gives a lot of money um, to childcare in the form of like grants to Head Start programs, but there needs to be a lot more. Um, and then it needs to also come from employers and, uh, uh, you know, venture capitalists and other uh, folks with deep pockets. Awesome, and I'd love to double click on that. So, I mean, childcare education is this, I think, tricky name for a sector that has a lot of care into it, more than education. Um, so I'd love to get from both you, Sarah and Chris, how can you think we can actually increase the supply? Is it just a matter of, of, of like, I mean, better salaries to, to bring more, attract more talent into, into the field? So, I mean, staffing is a, is a huge piece of it because the reason that providers can't just take, you know, an unlimited number of kids is because there are very strict ratio requirements. You need the staff to take the children uh, to open new classrooms. Um, but one of the things we focus on a lot at Winnie um, is all of the capacity that is out there but being unused. You know, the same spot, there are hours in the day where it may go unused or, you know, there's a part-time space available um, but you have to match that spot to a family that actually needs that particular care, which is a really difficult problem and can only be done if you're doing that at, you know, enormous scale. And so you really need all of the spaces and all of the knowledge of what's available in one place and all of the parents in one place so that you can kind of do that sophisticated matching uh, to f at least fill the capacity that's, that's going unused. Yeah, what we, yeah. Everything um, what Sarah said, I agree with, and I'll, I'll add that uh, the way we think about it is how can we help more people start home-based childcare programs? And uh, I, I've seen home-based childcare programs be sort of an incubator for you know pretty significant growth within communities and solving um, the supply issues. And what what makes home-based childcare so great? I'm going to evangelize home-based childcare here. <laughs> what makes it so great is um, a childcare provider, on average, earns about thirty-six thousand to forty thousand dollars a year um, uh, working at a like, like a teacher in a childcare program. And in most markets, they can earn that amount if they just start their own program and serve anywhere between. In, believe it, in the Bay Area, you can do it with one child. Um, in certain markets, you can do it with three children. And so. You can earn as much as you were earning as a preschool teacher running your own program out of your own home. And, and the reason why is you don't, the, uh, the person who's running the program doesn't have to pay real estate costs. They're just doing it out of their homes. Mm -hmm. And so there's, just a, there's, a, there's a savings to the community by doing it that way. But then that person who starts that program, they start to realize that they can earn a significant a lot more if they stick with it and they continue growing their business. So they then have three kids, they get to four kids, five kids, they're earning more than they've ever have before. And what we've seen with our earliest cohorts of childcare providers, they end up starting centers. So um, many of our, 
many of the providers we've worked with have started centers. One provider we've worked with has started seven centers and has played a huge role in filling in the gaps for the, for the community she's serving. And so, um, you know, I'm a big believer in inspiring people to start these programs because it creates jobs, but it also plays a role in, in solving our supply issues. Awesome. So th there is a lot of guilt and judgment around screen time for, for young children. And I think the pandemic has <laughs> dramatically acceler accelerated that. However, I think there's a change in the sense that there's a greater appreciation for quality screen time. So I I'd love to get your view on like how much entrepreneurs sh should focus on building directly for children versus uh, for caregivers and, and families. So, um, yeah, screen time is a hotly debated topic, mm -hmm. but I think we can all admit or realize that uh, the wheels came off a bit during COVID in terms of that happening. And it's not as much about limiting the screen time um, as it is making screen time valuable, which is what we're always trying to say. So to the, like I talked about those open platforms and the toxic content that kids are watching, what we're trying to do is surface content that enables learning in the home. Um, that enables kids to learn both, you know, things like uh, counting and math and science and history, but also follow their passions. And all kind of learning we think is good learning. And so if you like sports or DIY or cooking um, or hiking uh, or dinosaurs, you know, we've enabled uh, high quality creators that exemplify, that make content specifically for kids then bring that to the service and program it in a way where kids can, can experience that learning. So for us, it's about finding those creators. Those creators are out there. We look at thousands of creators. We've selected about 450, about 500 shows at this point in time uh, that are age appropriate and that are along the lines of topics that are most relevant and interesting to kids. But it is, to answer your question, made for kids content. We think that's very important. We think that the applications themselves that they ride on also have to be made for kids. And again, these open user-generated platforms were designed for adults and it's not really appropriate. I, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I think I think common sense is providing a valuable service, and and that it's important to you know kind of the work that you're doing, is 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 of service to children, so they have the right kind of content. But I also think it's just important, at least like at Love Every, it's it's core to us. Just you know, fifty percent of who you become is in your genetics, and then fifty percent is the experiences that you have primarily in early childhood, and. You know that's that's probably you know time that it, it can be spent on a screen and and you know if it is it should be like good content but it's it's not the highest and best use of that child's time uh, to be on a screen uh, it's it's better for them to be engaging with uh, things in the real world uh, interacting with with different kinds of, of real world play objects or play experiences so that they can really build the neural pathways that are gonna help them solve problems and communicate, regulate their emotions over time. And you know, I know the American Academy of Pediatrics has sort of relaxed a little bit their standards on, on screen time limitations. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that uh, screen time is not the best time uh, for children, especially in early childhood. So I think, I think it's a valuable service, but I think it's also really important to just sort of acknowledge that there's, there's other stuff that kids can be doing that, that there, is better for there's, them. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about that. You know, we're not encouraging kids to just sit on the screen. Uh, it's just meeting parents where they are and meeting kids where they are to some degree. That it's 100%. happening anyway. Yeah. Um, we do have a program that we uh, have developed called Your Turn which is this watch and do initiative that we say that at the end of the program, again, because a lot of the stuff that kids are watching is hobby based. So if it's cooking or if it's hiking or if it's sports, that it's then your turn, you know, to go out into the actual physical world to go to do something yourself, to step away, to encourage people to step away from the screen time. And there's also a digital citizenship curriculum that Common Sense Media has developed for schools that we use as interstitial content to teach kids about healthy media habits so that they understand uh, not only about the screen time, but also about privacy and protecting their privacy, uh, being appropriate online and, and those sorts of issues. One um, question I got a lot during the last two years of the pandemic was like, are virtual babysitters or you know, online preschools going to replace what you do at Winnie? And uh, you know, I think we saw firsthand that, and I saw firsthand with my three young kids, that like for our earliest learners, there's absolutely no replacement to in-person care, 
in a group environment with other children, that is how our children learn, by being around other children and playing. Uh, and, and so, you know, for me, it was just like a huge testament to the, the power of this industry. Like, it is truly essential. When everything else could move online, we could not move uh, early education online. That had to continue happening in person. And, you know, my one child who, like, couldn't attend in person because they didn't have it, like, he really struggled. Um, and so I think that was, you know, there's now all these studies coming out about the pandemic babies and how behind they are in their development because early childhood, you do need to be around humans and especially other children. Yeah, but I, I do think, Eric, you bring up a good point that you got to meet parents where they are. And, you know, every parent's got a different situation. Maybe they're working multiple jobs, you know, or, uh, or you know, who knows, but there's, you know, all of us, you know, uh, with when we're, we're parenting through early childhood, we, we turn to screens, you know, from time to time, you know, varying degrees. And so it's, it's a valuable service that Common Sense is It's a provided, tool for, for parents. Sure. It's, it's yeah. an amazing tool for parents. And, you know, probably everyone who's a parent has, has used screens and I use them every single day. But uh, I think we should think of it that way instead of um, a tool for our children. Chris, I'd love to get, get your take on this uh, from the caretaker perspective. Like, how are they thinking about like screen time? What's the, I mean, the point of view from parents leaving their kids there? How, how are they, they thinking about this? Uh, in our in our schools, we um, encourage our providers to uh, use as little screen time as possible, but it's inevitable that they'll need to. And for parents, uh, you know, we encourage parents to use as little screen time as possible, but again, it's inevitable. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that's our that's a general point of view on it. Awesome. So the, this generation of parents, and I think we, we, it's a great segue to, to double click on, on the parent situation. Is like digitally native, and they start seeking support online, and we have like communities, social media, etc. And I think it's something is different about these parents is that they want to know, like especially like millennial parents, is like they want to know everything about <laughs> parenting. I think probably our parents were more like uh, in, intuition based. So I, I love to go like, how do you see the, the parent support and education space evolving? Uh, are you thinking about it from, from, your, from your own sectors? Uh, is services directly to parents uh, an interesting opportunity for, for any of you? I mean, absolutely, parents are overwhelmed, right? I mean, and there's just more and more information, more and more tools that, at their disposal, more and more opinions. You can go to Instagram or TikTok and be on an instant, it, like just this like nonstop, like doom scroll of advice that's not necessarily targeted to anything other than like what you happen to be lingering on, right? Uh, as opposed to what you actually need for your child. So uh, we see a tremendous opportunity to streamline that, make it age and stage based, uh, you know, make it part of a community. So we're, we're working on that on, on our different platforms. Um, I think we just, you know, if you look at a lot of the early sort of like products that came out for parents around parenthood content, a lot of it was, you know, something that, that actually raised their stress level and didn't make their lives easier, made them feel judged. So the trick that we're, we're trying to like work through is how do you reduce a parent's stress level, not make them feel judged, um, but at the same time, put them on top of like the information that's, that's useful to them. So reducing overwhelm, but still giving them information. So that's how we think about it. I think just to pick up on that, um, because I agree that parents are overwhelmed, a lot of the services that are out there have parental tools, but well, the feedback that we get constantly is they are overwhelming for parents. These are our media services. And so we try to make this very frictionless for them to get in, but the tools that we do provide for parents are for them to understand what their child is doing and watching. It's one of the things that we hear most often is, I know they're online, I don't really know what they're watching, I can't track it appropriately. And so we have reports, seven day and 30 day reports, where you can see what the child is watching and not um, to cut it off in a sense, but to bond and connect with them. So to say, I didn't know that 30% of the content that my child was watching was around dinosaurs or STEM or sports. And then there's a series of information that we can provide to them. Again, some of these do-togethers that we talked about or conversation starters that they can have around the topics to extend the learning beyond the screen time itself. Yeah, uh, just adding on to that, you know, we, we definitely found it, Winnie, like parents are, are overwhelmed uh, with the childcare decision. It's like your most precious thing in your life and uh, one of the most considered purchases you're gonna make. 
Um, we took the philosophy early on at Winnie that like we will treat all childcare providers the same and we will display all the information, all the licensing data about them and leave it up to parents to make the decision which provider is best for their child. Um, and we've kind of pivoted from that and now we, we actually verify providers and we uh, display at the top the providers who we think are going to respond to you, have accurate information, have high quality of care, their data is up to date, they're licensed and regulated. Um, because, you know, we found it, it, really the onus is on us as a platform to make sure that when we are recommending things to parents that, you know, we're, we're reducing uh, the, you know, just noise out there, um, still making all the information available to them, but definitely like we have a responsibility as a platform to prioritize the providers that we think are the best quality providers. Great. We've heard a lot about the, the impact of great resignation in, in EdTech, in the space in general. What do you, how do you think this, well, what this means for, for early childhood? How has this impact your, your work? I mean, I, okay, I, so I love every, I, I guess our, our total headcount grew 60% in the last year. And I, I, what I would say is if you're, if you're motivated around early childhood uh, or, or any kind of a, a mission-based focus in your work, you're, you're more likely to be drawn uh, to a company that's doing that or a nonprofit that's doing that. And so for us, like we haven't, we haven't seen a huge issue of churn, we've actually been able to take advantage of, of great resignation and and pull people in. And I think it's just because people are, if they're leaving a place, it's because uh, either they don't like the the work setup and and like it's not flexible the way that they need it, or it's because they're looking for more meaning in their lives after reflecting. And uh, I think for companies in this space, it's it's generally good news. Yeah, we haven't experienced a lot of resignation at at at, uh, at Wonder School, but. When I think about the way the market's evolving, I actually start thinking about uh, remote work, and um, and that's changed childcare pretty significantly. So you know, um, we used to we we all we still do, but we used to cluster in cities, and now people are because of remote work moving to places where there's a lot less childcare, and there hasn't really been a need for as much of it, and that's um, really changed the market for us. And so we're seeing childcare programs get started in markets we never would have considered. And we're seeing employers um, have to uh, change their benefits packages to, to support um, employees in places they didn't expect to. Yeah, we used to have like a huge differentiator for working at Winnie that, you know, we would be super flexible, you could work from home, uh, and now that's just expected. <laughs> um, so yeah. we've really had to up our game as an employer um, and think about how we can stand out even further and support, you know, especially working parents um, to work for our company because I think the baseline expectation of employees has increased and I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, unfortunately, the great resignation has not hit evenly and so still essential jobs were way more impacted than the kind of job you could do at home on a computer. So while like we may not have felt it as you know, acutely at our companies, I think the childcare industry has felt it really acutely um, because people are resigning from those positions to do other jobs that either pay better or are, you know, can be done from home or maybe perceived as safer. Um, so that's a huge kind of hurdle we now have um, in helping the childcare industry. Great. We, we've talked a lot, uh, a lot about so far about the market from different perspectives and stakeholders, parents, kids, uh, care, uh, caretakers. So now, now I want to like, uh, uh, go down into like what challenges are providers, where it's startups or existing companies, uh, and not, also, not only existing providers, but also like anyone who wants to come to the market, what challenges are they facing or we will face in order to like, serve this demand, which from all what you've told about is clearly uh, existing and growing here in a lot. So other challenges mm -hmm. to the market. I mean, I'm, I'm going to do it again from our perspective, which is a little bit different. Um, one of the things that we set out to do is to make sure that the service was free and ubiquitous. So there'll be subscription versions, but in order to reach as many people as possible and to be a counter to those open platforms, which are free, you know, it was very important to us. 
And for better or worse, and this is controversial, that means advertising. And so we, um, there was, uh, there are a lot of advertisers that is, are inappropriate and the experience is inappropriate on these platforms, but there are a lot of brands out there that are hesitant to advertise in these markets because they also disagree that the environment is not safe and it's not suitable. And so what we set out to do is to borrow best practices, a lot of which were on TV where there were standards in place that don't exist online, to create safe and suitable advertising experiences and socially responsible advertising experiences with very strict guidelines. And there are brands that we're working with now and brands like uh, Nike and Apple and others that we've pulled in to prove out this theory that there is a way to do this in a way that's appropriate and can therefore provide a service that is free to as many people as possible. So that was a challenge that we're trying to overcome. I mean, I want to just be a little bit optimistic. In the last six and a half years I've worked in this industry, like I think there's never been a better time with fewer challenges to innovate in early childhood and kind of parenting tech more broadly. Uh, you know, when I was starting Winnie, there were very few companies in childcare doing any kind of innovation for parents. And now we have, you know, wearable breast pumps that you can just walk around and pump breast milk. Like that was unheard of when I was having my first child. We have amazing products that educate our kids that don't leave me like so bored with a baby. Uh, thank you, love every. Um, and uh, just like all the innovation is, is amazing and there's like investment in early childhood. It's now like there are actually investors that are dedicated to this. Like when I was first raising for Winnie, people said like we would never fund anything in this space. Um, so I think it is a really exciting time and I think COVID showed you know just how essential the childcare industry is, just how important early education is. Um, so if you, you know, are, are considering doing anything in, in this area, I think there's never been a better time. Just completely agree, yeah. Awesome. And so, I mean, so we've talked about, I think, parents, kids, care uh, caregivers. Someone we haven't talked about so far is companies. What are you seeing, like, in terms of, like, because, and, and this is my experience as investing, like, we've seen, some companies starting to think about childcare, whether it's education or care, as a benefit. Uh, what's your, your feeling from, from the market in the, talking to, to customers every day? Like, do you think this is going to be a trend? And is, do, you, do you see funding I mean, uh, coming a lot from, from corporations or companies in general? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, I'm pretty sure the largest company that serves the childcare market primarily works with employers, Bright Horizons. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're, you know, very successful company and continuing to grow. And there's a lot of gaps in the market. And there's a number of companies that are starting out to, to serve employers uh, to meet their childcare needs. Um, and Wonder School is working with a number of employers, but you see companies like Clio and, uh, and Kinside. Uh, and, th and there's more companies that are pivoting into the market to, to provide childcare services to, to employers. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there. Do you, do you see it as, as I mean, because I think the Bright Horizons case is particular because there are like a lot of money is coming through corporations, but something interesting that I've been seeing is like companies going, um, I mean, selling to corporations, but actually just because corporation will just fund it like as, as a, benefit for to whatever like any kind of benefit they're just going to start giving money like in a wallet for for employees and it this seems like this is becoming like a I don't know like a differentiator of, or a benefit that empl new employees are expecting so I'd love to get your, your take on that yeah I mean one thing we've seen on Winnie is like what the kinds of care parents are searching for has become more distributed it's not just in major metro areas because you don't commute necessarily into a big city anymore to do your work uh, people are looking for more flexible hours because maybe they've kind of pieced it together and can work from home some days and only need childcare some days or some hours. Or just work has gotten, it's not nine to five anymore. You know, people work jobs at all kinds of hours and on the weekend and, and the care that people need sort of reflects that uh, flexibility. So I think it's going to be increasingly difficult for employers to, it was already hard for employers to meet 
every employee's needs when it came to care. Um, and I do think we're gonna see more employers just giving money um, in, in something like a wallet uh, because then they can kind of be hands off and they don't have to specialize in, in finding that care. Um, but uh, I think there's also companies that may emerge that may say like, we'll take this all off your hands and do it for you. And there's plenty of them kind of entering the market. Um, it remains to be seen though, if they can, um, I think they will end up facing, you know, a lot of the same challenges that parents have, which is there has to be, be the supply there. Um, but I do think it, it presents an even more difficult challenge for employers because of you know, just the really wide range of what mm -hmm. workers are now looking for when it comes to care. Absolutely, and I think that's that's where Bright Horizons has seen great success because I, I think that I feel like they're like a high touch product, but it will work probably for huge companies, not necessarily for the vast majority of of, of well, I, of employers. To that, because I, I actually don't talking to a lot of employers and just like what I see anecdotally, I don't think a wallet would be enough because. Mm -hmm. As Sarah was mentioning, you could give employees money, but there's not enough supply. Mm -hmm. There just simply isn't. And so the, I, you know, I think the best thing an employer can do is guarantee high quality supply for their employees where they live. It's expensive, uh, <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of fear around the taking on that risk. Uh, and that's actually the the biggest challenge that um, I see in the market: mm -hmm. getting an employer to feel comfortable, you know, creating uh, 50 in-home childcare programs <laughs> near where mm -hmm. their employees live. It's just a scary proposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what we see is if you do that, that's like the greatest gift you can give to an employee who has a child. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So we have a few minutes left, uh, and I'd love to get like any closing a message for, from you to any entrepreneur or person who's thinking about uh, starting to build something in, in, in this space? Um. I mean, I would just say uh, there's a very practical reality to meeting kids where they are and to meeting parents where they are, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, it's not always uh, the logical or the popular way to go, but it's a way to really try and make change with commercial solutions on the platforms and in the experiences that kids are used to and uh, trying to uh, have positive creators thrive and positive um, content experiences for kids, in our case, in order to do that. Yeah, the, the message I'll share is there's a lot of opportunity in the ECE space. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter in starting companies in the ECE space. Just don't compete with Wonderschool. <laughs> 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 I, I guess what I'd add to that is just um, there's, there's a ton of opportunity, but I think it's really important to obsess about what your target customer really needs mm -hmm. uh, and what, what problem you're actually solving for them rather than trying to force fit you know, what you think is a clever business model uh, to a problem set. Um, it happens that Love Every is a subscription. Um, we wouldn't be as retentive as we are and have as much loyalty as we have if we weren't actually solving a problem by being a subscription. And uh, I think you see with a lot of startups, like people try to do a clever business model mm -hmm. and, and then force fit that and then like have some customer interviews that sort of justify their business model. And you really, like, you really have to approach this, this space with a lot of heart and, and care for what your customers are going through and the, the pain they're feeling and, and think about how you're going to solve that first and then get to the business model. And I'll just add, like, this is not an industry that gets billions of dollars to any single company where you can have this kind of overnight success. So come into it for the right reasons and find your mission um, because it, it, you know, it's going to take 10 years longer than you expect it to take. Uh, Trust me, I know. Um, and uh, if you can always go back to like, why are you in it? Uh, I think that that has helped me. Love that. That's that's a great message to to finish. So, thank you, everyone. It's great to have you, and thanks all the the four founders who are here.